What's the most important thing when you're right on the edge of something important and ready to give up? I would argue it is someone standing with you reminding who you are to say, keep going. That's exactly what we're gonna explore with Joshua and Caleb today. I hope you'll jump into the teaching notes, download those to be able to follow along. Maybe grab a friend to watch with who you can reflect on the things that you're finding in God's word as we go along. But we're jumping in in our series, Shoulder to Shoulder. Here we go. Last week we dove into this idea that we need some great people ahead of us whose life we can kind of learn from and take on and remember that there's always someone kind of right behind us, just a step behind us watching who we are and that's influencing who they're becoming. But I said last week there was a third question we were going to explore, and we're going to do that all day today. It's the one who is alongside us. Who are the people that we are calling right to our side that when we step into the thick of things, the challenges of life, the kind of adventures that God invites us on all along the way, who are the people who are lockstep with us right next to us? And we're going to explore what the best kind of people look like right out of the scripture uh, in Numbers chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna land in the book of Numbers chapter 13 here in just a few minutes. While you find your way there, in fact, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, I just encourage you, you can scan the QR on the back of the seats, you can scan this QR right here. It's gonna take you to a couple links. The first one is a Bible app that you could always have a Bible with you if you don't own one already. Uh, Or the second link is the notes that I'm gonna go through, which has a lot of the scripture in it today. Uh, Another way to find your way there is uh, this study that we've been doing along the way. If you haven't grabbed one of these, you could do this with a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, people, anyone in your life. You can step in, look at what God has said, figure out more about who he is and who he's inviting you to be really, really simply. You don't need any expertise. You don't need any training. We just look into God's word, which we'll do here in a moment. But here's what I want to invite you to do first. Call to mind some of the adventures you have been on in your life. No matter how long your life is, doesn't matter how your adventure is compared to anyone around you, call to mind some of the adventures that you've been on. Uh, They could be like literal adventures, uh, like the time Kyle and Jordan and I climbed Half Dome in the dark. It was awesome. It's a great day. Story on top of story from that. Uh, I could talk about a guy whose bachelor party was a kayak trip through Illinois. They do have rivers there. They're not very fast, but we did uh, kayak for a couple of days and hit some rapids, and it was awesome right alongside uh, Josh and a few other guys. Uh, We can think about uh, this Ragnar trail race I got to run one time uh, with uh, a number of guys. We actually set out to try to place one time. We ended up getting third, but only because we recruited a bunch of young red horse engineers and they were runners. It was great. I was the old guy, they carried me. Uh, It could be a a great hike, like setting out uh, anywhere along the way. It could be any of those kind of adventures, but we could go a little farther too. I mean, you may not be an outdoor adventurer and that's just fine. What kind of adventures have you been on? A road trip that was longer than you thought you could sustain. Uh, Maybe it was uh, stepping into a new job. I remember stepping into teaching alongside a guy named Tom, eventually stepping into uh, ministry alongside a guy guy named Matt and Joel. What are the adventures that you've kind of embarked on? I can't help but think about the marriage almost 25 years for us now that Lane and I set out on, and listen, at 19 and 20 years old, we had no idea what we were signing up for. It has been an adventure, and four kids along the way. I moved to Las Vegas. I remember the road trip from Illinois to Las Vegas alongside Michael Cooper and Jason Sniff, who are just like, listen, you don't know what's out there for you, let's just ride along, we'll get you out there and fly back. It could be quick adventures that were actually like just a, a, a moment in time, an event, and a trip, or it could be the kind of adventures that you've embarked on to really offer the best of your life to something. But the truth is, it's in those moments that we need the best kind of people alongside us. Um, One of my favorite quotes, you've heard it from me before, if you've been around, is about adventure is this, is adventure calls us out. It requires us to be something that we hope we are, but we aren't quite sure that we are. It asks more of us than we're sure. It's something we want to be. We're like, I don't know if we're going to make it to the top. I don't know if we could really step into that kind of job and do well. I don't know if we could really make the move across the country. All the kind of things. Adventure just calls us out and invites us to be something we aren't quite sure that we are, but we sure hope that we are. And in those kind of moments, it's really easy to back down, to settle, to quit, and to step back. And what really helps along the way is what I mentioned in every one of the uh, adventures I mentioned was some names of some people who went with me. 
Somebody alongside us in the midst of adventure not only brings a whole bunch more joy and fun, but it keeps us going when it would be way too easy to stop. This is the kind of story that we're gonna look at here in just a minute. But before we do, I just wanna bring it right into today. Maybe you've thought of some adventures in your past, but I just wanna ask you, what are the adventures you're on right now? What are the things that are asking more of you? You're not quite sure you brought enough. And as much as that, who are the people right next to you cheering you on, picking you up, pointing you in the best direction? Now, however you may have found your way here or not, around here what we talk about most is what God is inviting us into. We just believe that Jesus is alive among anyone who will trust him and that he puts his spirit in us and among us to partner with him in turning the world right side up. So the adventures we talk about mostly are how do we partner with God who loves everyone and has good in mind for everyone to help everyone find out and experience that. We offer the good of our lives. We asked it this way last week. Where are you offering your very best energy? Where does the best of you go? And we wanna be the kind of people who are partnering with God to do his work everywhere that we go and offering the best of ourselves there. Those are the kind of adventures we're on. Any of you who are not followers of Jesus, I always think God's truth applies to every single one of us and helps every single one of us. And so I think the things I'm gonna point out are still gonna be helpful to you, but I'm just gonna say, God has an adventure ahead of you. He has good things in mind for you. He put you on this place for a reason, for a purpose. He spoke good and meaning into you. You are an image bearer of the living God with essential contribution to offer everyone around you. And when you say yes to Jesus, he unleashes that and surrounds people, surrounds you with people to go after things that really matter for a really long time. And by the way, they lead to a whole bunch of joy along the way. Challenge, yeah. Joy, absolutely. This is what we're exploring, Numbers chapter 13. Did you find your way there yet? I'm gonna give you five quick descriptors right out of this scripture. It's the same scripture you're gonna look at if you're doing the study with us, or you can do it this week or any other week, doesn't matter. But I'm gonna give you five descriptors that I noticed, and I'm gonna tell you there's at least five or 10 more that we could have brought up, but I'm just gonna offer you a few. And here's what I wanna encourage you to do as I kinda walk us through this story. To consider two things. Who are the people you are inviting alongside you? I'm gonna give you some descriptors of the best kind of people to invite alongside you based on what we're seeing in the Bible. But the second question is, how are you showing up like this kind of person for others? Everybody wants great people in their life. Can I get a head nod? That's true. Anybody like, I got too many great people in my life, somebody get these people away. (laughs) I don't think so. Everybody wants great people in their life. But here's the thing I keep telling my son on his baseball team. I said, listen, show up like the teammate you wanna have. You wanna have this kind of friend, show up like the kind of friend, the kind of partner you wanna have along the way. So think in both directions. God, what are you stirring in me to show up better for my people? And God, who are the people you wanna call to my side? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Numbers chapter 13, let me catch you up in the story really, really quickly. There's a guy about 400 years before what we're gonna read, his name is Abraham. And God promises to him, you, I'm gonna begin with you and we're gonna redeem everything that was broken in creation through you and your family. And he made him three promises. I'm gonna make your family, he didn't even have any kids at the moment, I'm gonna make your family a nation with too many people to count. Like the sand on the seashore, your descendants are gonna be innumerable. Your your family's gonna be huge, that's promise number one. Promise number two was, I'm gonna give you a land in which you guys are gonna thrive and live, and when everybody looks at you, living in the land I gave you, they're gonna look at me, God, he says, and say, wow. Like you are gonna be a reflection of my generosity, God says to Abraham. A nation, a land, and then he says, through you and your descendants, every person on the planet ever will be blessed. As followers of Jesus, we know that promise was always about Jesus, his arrival, and his rescue. It would be several hundred years before that would happen, but that was the promise. A nation, a land, and a blessing. Everybody cool? Here's what happened, though. Uh, Abraham took matters into his own hands. Can anyone relate? Uh, How did that go for us? Sometimes great, sometimes terrible. What makes us followers of Jesus is too often as we took things into our own hands without God's help, they started great and it came off the rails pretty quick. Can I get it? Uh Uh-huh. So we're just like, God, why don't you lead the way? We'll join what you're doing. Don't join what we're doing. Well, our ideas, mediocre. Your ideas, great. Let's do what you have in mind, God. But Abraham, like all of us, did what we do and he took matters into his own hands. 
In fact, uh, it's really the history that leads to what's happening in Israel today. We don't make political comments around here. I'm not here to tell anyone what to think politically, but here's what I know. There's some people really suffering today in a lot of ambiguity, and I hope as you read and watch all the things, I hope that we are the kind of people who begin relationally and spiritually and ask God to support and help everyone. That we would pray for leaders to make wise decisions. That before we would ever express an opinion about what we think should happen or whatever, that we would at first ask God to do what only he can do. So can we just pause and do that right quick? God, have your way. People doing their thing all kinds of places and it is making a mess for a lot of people. God, we don't presume to know what the right thing is, but we know the right one to ask for help and that's you. And so God, would you protect the innocent? Would you guide leaders? Would you provide wisdom? And would you have your way in Jesus' name, amen. So listen, uh, that family ends up in slavery, becomes huge. Two million people in slavery in Egypt and finally God says, enough is enough. It's time for you to have the land. And so he brings all these people out of Egypt in an epic rescue, and they're wandering across the desert, and we find ourselves in Numbers chapter 13. Y'all with me? Took a minute, but now we're here. Numbers 13, one, it says, the Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land. This is the land he had promised. Go across the river, go explore all this place that I wanna give you and see how good it is. Explore the land of Canaan that I'm going to give to the Israelites. And so he did that. He sent one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So there were 12 groups of people from the 12 kids that were in Abraham's family, and, and, and this uh, one leader from each of these massive groups of people, they go and they explore. You can see the adventure, right? They had spent the last couple hundred years at least in slavery, and now they had freedom and the opportunity to conquer a land and experience all the good that God had in mind for them. And so he chooses 12. It's a mixed bag, though, I'll tell you why in a minute. Verse 17, it says this. Moses gave these men these instructions, and he sent them out to explore the land. He said, go north through the Negev into the hill country, see what the land is like, and find out whether people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what the kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do they have towns? Uh, do the towns have walls, or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back some samples of the crops that you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting ripe grapes. So listen, uh, he sends them on recon. He's like, listen, God has said this is ours, but let's go find out what we're about to find out. It's not like it was just sitting there uh, like on its own. There were people living there. God had promised you will like harvest grapes that you didn't from vineyards you didn't plant. You will harvest crops that you didn't plant. I have provided everything for you. God's generosity was about to be on display. In verse 21, it says this, so they went up and they explored the land from the wilderness. And after exploring the land for 40 days, that's a pretty sweet adventure for these 12 guys, wouldn't you say? Running, sneaking through this giant land, experiencing all the good that God had promised. He said, this is gonna be ours. What? This is crazy. This wandering through here, seeing all the things, but realizing some things along the way. And finally, after 40 days, they returned. Here's what I wanna say, round number one. If you want really great partners in your life, great partners are adventurers exploring what God wants. These 12 guys went on an epic trip. And listen, what God has invited us into is always an adventure. Whether it's raising a family faithfully, whether it's leading a business that leads to flourishing for others, whether it's showing up differently than everyone else at work in a way that causes a thriving, healthy, affirming culture all across the way, whatever God has called you into, whether it's to like really be an example of Jesus in your neighborhood. For every follower of Jesus, we do have this calling and adventure in front of us, to show up in Jesus' name in the life of every single individual that we meet and help them see Jesus more clearly. He has called us not just to be followers of his, but to make followers of his. And listen, that's an adventure because we're not always sure we're up for it. We're not always sure how it's gonna go. But the best partners are the ones alongside us exploring what God wants. Not just trying to help us get by, not just helping the business survive, not just helping the kids not go crazy. God, what do you want? God, what have you invited us to? God, where do you want us to put our very best energy? I said it early, God has, earlier, God has partnership in mind for each and every one of us. He is not like, uh, like a power up or an energy drink. God is not like, hey, I got a thing going here, God, can you come add a little juice to this? That's a bad idea. 
God is more like, I will give you the honor of being caught up in what I am doing. And this is what we do when we say yes to Jesus. In fact, there's a whole bunch of people who have said yes to Jesus who are gonna be baptized this weekend, and we're gonna celebrate. They're stepping into that journey as well. And so hang out after service if you wanna be a, one of the celebrators with us. He's not here to add to our plans. He's drawing us into what he is doing. And so we need to be people who are listening. God, what is it that you have in front of us? God, how would you have me approach what's in front of me? God, how would you have us engage this season? What are you up to? Because he's always up to something. We're seeing this happen all the time around Canyon Ridge as people jump onto teams and jump into groups and try to lead their family well and are asking great questions. Let's be co-adventurers together. But here's the thing. Just because people set out on a journey together doesn't mean the journey's gonna go well. Can I get an uh-huh from people who know? And the only way you find out is to take the journey. Only in taking the leap and getting moving together Will you find out, does God have good in mind? And are these the people I'm gonna journey along with? There's something about the tension and tiredness of adventure that has the opportunity to shape us or wreck us. And it does a little bit of both depending on where we are in our life. This is what happens to some of these guys who come back. It says this, this was their report to Moses. Wait for it, Yahtzee. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land that you sent us to explore, and indeed, it is a bountiful country. It has everything we need. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, which was in, uh, like a first, uh, or an idiom among these people that would describe like, oh, it's so good. It has not only great things now, but it has potential for even greater things. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it introduces, and you gotta, you, you gotta read Numbers 13 and 14. I don't have time to read it all. Uh, but literally, these two guys uh, have a pole over their shoulders because the, the collection and branch of grapes that they uh, hijacked was so big they couldn't carry it with just one person. Like, it was this epic example of how providing God was gonna be. Here's the kind of fruit it introduces. Great things, great return, they all come back, 40-day adventure, and then comes a giant butt. But Caleb, or sorry, but the people living in their, uh, the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, and we'll get to that in a minute. So immediately there's this turn. They see this amazing land that God had provided that has everything that they need, but they got a little bit myopic, some of these. There were 12 of these people who went on this recon mission, right? 10 of them expressed this. Two of them are the kind of people that we want alongside us. Their names were Caleb and Joshua. One of them stands up and Caleb says this. Caleb tried to quiet all the people as they stood before Moses and he says, let's go. Turn to somebody next to you and say, let's go. This is the kind of partner that you need. That when you're stepping at the top of the cliff jump and they're like shaking and nervous, they need you standing next to them and say, let's go. And maybe give you a push, whatever it takes. We need people who say, let's go who have an adventurous spirit who invite people into what God is doing. Here's what happens, and we'll see it as it unfolds, is that some of these guys get really negative. Some of these guys saw all of the possibility and said, whoa, here are all the barriers and the boundaries. Not Caleb, we need people like Caleb. Let's go at once to take the land, he said, for we can certainly conquer it. Here's the second one I would say, if you're calling people to your side and you wanna show up well for your friends, great partners say, can if not can't because. You ever meet anybody that's got a long list? Well, we can't because we don't have enough money. We can't because we don't have enough time. We can't because we gotta get the car fixed. We can't because, can't because, can't because, can't because, right? People show up with a dream and then it gets howled to death, right? How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? We can't because, can't because. Great partners are the people who say, yeah, we can if. They don't deny all the barriers, but they see all the possibilities. This is a frame from a book called The Great Constraint that if you're a business leader or a problem solver, you gotta read it. It's not a Christian book, but it's an amazing book. This frame of we can if. If life has got you just banging your head against the wall, maybe try walking around the wall. And can if is a way of finding a path around that. It's crazy to me, crazy to me, that people, these 12 people could look at all the same circumstance have taken all the same journey. These were the same 12 guys who had been leading giant groups of people 
out of slavery. These were the same 12 who had walked through the Red Sea and watched Egypt get swallowed up, Egypt's army get swallowed up behind them. These are the same 12 leaders who were guiding groups of people at the bottom of a mountain when God said, here's what my character is like by offering them the Ten Commandments. These same 12 people wander into the land and they see things so differently. 10 see only barriers and two see all possibility. We want people alongside us and we wanna show up with, as people who are full of possibility. It goes on in verse 31, it says this, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them, you hear it? Can't because, we can't. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the land of the Israelites. Do you know anyone who spreads bad reports? Do we live in a culture of bad reports spreading right and left? Man, they just fly like wildfire. They get clicks like crazy. Same thing happens in a camp of two million people in the middle of the desert. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone. Not only are the people strong, but the land is gonna devour us, they said. Anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw there were huge, really. The people are strong, the people are big, the land's aggressive. We even saw giants, listen. Have you ever uh, like watch a toddler just like lose their mind expressing things and their imagination just runs wild? This is what happens. All of their fear just starts to compound and they begin to exaggerate. When they even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, next to them we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. These descendants of Anak were a historical thing, but it had become this descriptor, not that different from, say, the boogeyman. Like their imaginations ran away from them. Yeah, there were descendants of people who were substantially larger in the Middle East than others. And they were like, they're giants. There's no way we can go up against these people. But they turned it into so much more. They tried to justify their fears and their can't because is only multiplied. That's not the kind of people we wanna call to our sides. It's not the kind of people we wanna be. He says, next to them we felt like grasshoppers and that's what they thought too. This perspective, oh my goodness, it just crushed their spirits and spread like wildfire. Uh, would you just pick your favorite hand for a minute, right or left, doesn't matter. You don't even have to explain it or defend it, just pick your favorite one. And here's what I wanna ask you really quickly. What is bigger, your hand or me? Your hand or me, which one? Which one's bigger? I'm bigger than your hand, probably, right? If not, I would like to meet you. Uh, that sounds really interesting. Uh, but here's what, here's what happens. What, what happens if you place your hand like right here? What's bigger, your hand or me? Your hand has total capacity to block out all of me. I don't even exist if you get close enough and suddenly you all look like toddlers playing hide and seek. Listen, this is what happened to these guys. All the barriers were placed right in front of them and they couldn't see anything else. They were looking at the size of the people, the aggression of the land. They're like, listen, at all this good harvest, they completely lost sight of it. They only saw the people who were likely to defend it. When the barriers in our lives between us or you step to the top of the cliff, that's going to be a blast to jump into the water that's down below. Suddenly the height is all you can experience. You forget about the joy of the leap, the splash at the bottom and the laughing climb back to the top to go again. All you can see is the barrier in front of you. All you can see is the diagnosis in front of you. All you can see is the challenge in front of you. And if you only dial into that, and you don't have anyone next to you who can invite you to a wider perspective, you're likely to stop right there. Halfway up Half Dome, legs were so painful, it was only Kyle and Jordan next to me who kept me walking. Halfway from Illinois to Las Vegas saying, what are we doing moving this far away from our family? It was Jason and Michael who said, we're gonna keep going. We need the kind of people alongside us who see and remember the things that we have lost sight of or forgotten. We can't allow adversity in the midst of adventure to become like this and block out all the other things that are true. You see, great partners are not just adventurers and great partners are not just can if people, but here's your third thing. Great partners see with three. Tell somebody see with three. See with three. Don't just see with your eyes. See with your ears and see with your memory. 
Because here's what Joshua and Caleb knew. As they stood in front of a whiny, complaining, revolting group, like a rebellious group of people, they were not just seeing the barriers with their eyes. They were seeing it with their ears. Because it wasn't just that this land out there was good and had big people and giant walls. It was that God said it was theirs. And if God said, it will be. God has never broken his word and will never break his word. And Caleb and Joshua took their hand away from their face long enough to remember there's more to see than what we can see. More has been said than we can see. And by the way, everybody, this is mind boggling to me. Same 12 guys, I already told you this. They grew up in Egypt in slavery. They're probably 40-ish years old, right? Prime of their life. Let's, can we just acknowledge mid 40s, prime of life. Can I just live in denial for a minute? <laughs> That that's the prime, they're in the prime of their life. Having walked out of slavery with the opportunity to lead two million people to this amazing land that God had promised. And the only reason they're standing there, it was not their strength, it was not their prowess, it was not their brilliance, it was not their resources. It was God who humbled Pharaoh, miraculously carries them out of slavery, miraculously carries them through the Red Sea, and miraculously wipes out the army chasing them. All they could see was this. But they needed their memory to say, if God can wipe out Egypt, those walls are not a big deal. If God can carry us out of generations of slavery, then people taller than us, not a problem. They needed to see with three, and we need people alongside us who will do the same, that will remind us. In fact, I've got a friend who just told me this past uh, week or so, it's a story about a moment where they just wanted to fold and quit. They had moved far from home and stepped into an unfamiliar environment. It was an adventure. But all the adversity they found when they got there was shaking them to their core, and they kinda just wanted to go back where they came from, just go home called a friend and said, hey, uh, this is what I'm thinking about. That friend hung up, got on a plane, and showed up in this person's front yard and said, no. That is not what God said. That is not who you are. That is not what's gonna happen. What's it gonna take for us to keep moving forward? This is the kind of person that we need next to us, that when all we can see is the adversity in front of us, they see with three. We cannot, don't miss this, we cannot let what we see block out what we have heard and what God has done. We cannot let what we see. I'm not saying there's no hand, I'm just saying it might not be as big as you think. It's not that we need to live in denial of what's actually around us and just say God's got it, that's ridiculous. God has invited us to partnership in the reality of life. We don't wanna like, Discon- like disconnect our faith from reality. Reality is there is a diagnosis. The marriage is challenged. That kid is about to lose his mind. This workplace is hard. Listen, it's all true. Acknowledge that it's true. Joshua and Caleb never said there weren't walls or big people. They just said that's not all. We can't let what we see block out what we have heard and what God has done. Pessimism is contagious and panic spreads quickly. And this is what happens. This is the beginning of chapter 14. The whole community, it says, the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. They were complaining against leaders. That never happens anymore. It's a great relief, isn't it? (laughs) They cried out against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. Or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Did you see the turn that just happened? When everything in front of you looks big and painful, everybody starts looking for someone to blame. They start with Moses and Aaron. But they take a dangerous turn and they just started blaming God, the one who had rescued them. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to return to Egypt? And isn't that the temptation? Called to the adventure of a jump into a river from the top of a cliff and all you wanna do is go back down to where you walked from with no story of adventure ahead of you. It would have been better for us to return to Egypt. And so they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Oh, 
this leader's the problem, let's get a new one. Everyone had someone to blame, and they took it into their own hands, and this is the story that messed up most of our lives, that we started taking things into our own hands, and we realized for all the challenge in front of us, our hands are seldom big enough for it. Whether it's the challenge that makes its way to us or the amazing invitation God makes for us to do things that are beyond our own strength. All the joy of enduring the challenge or seizing the opportunity is lost when you start going backwards. All of us at some point are gonna come to our limit. The hope is we don't come to that point alone. They wanted the easy option and the sad truth about life is there seldom is one. There's one that looks easy for a minute, but it has teeth on the other side. Now Moses and Aaron see clearly what's going on because great partners see with three and they're like, whoa, blaming us? That's one thing, we don't really like that. Blaming God, that's risky. And so Moses and Aaron, it says in verse five, Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground Face down on the ground before the whole community. Their whole thing is like, y'all are in for it. We need to like turn toward God right now. And so they just fall down on the ground like, y'all don't even realize what you're doing. You need to regain your senses. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua and Caleb, these are our guys. You need people like Joshua and Caleb. Co-adventurers, people who can if, people who see with three, and Joshua and Caleb take a stand together. The son of, I'm not gonna try to say that guy's name. They tore their clothing. And they said to all the people of Israel, it's like, we saw what they saw. We were there. The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Who's going to bring him into the land? Was it their strength that was going to overcome the giants? Was it their strength or their genius that was gonna conquer the walls? No, it's him that's gonna bring us into the land. They took their hand away from their face. They're like, look, y'all are losing your minds. And it's time somebody stood up and told you the truth. Like that friend on the front lawn says, no, that is not what God said. You are not going home. You are called to more. This is not who you are. You have forgotten yourself and we are going to keep going. What do you need to keep going? This is what Caleb and Joshua stand up and try to do, and this is what great partners do. I'm wondering who in your life needs you to show up like that for them today. I'm wondering who of you are wavering right now that need to tap a friend on the shoulder and say, I'm about to quit. Tell me to keep going. This is what they do. Great partners stand together. That's number four of five, and we'll round the corner quickly to number five. Great partners stand together. Uh, Now, Moses and Aaron didn't, they fell face down. But that was a stand in and of itself. It was a stand for God's reputation. It was a a wake up call to the people that they loved, acknowledging who God was. And Joshua Caleb literally stood up, says take your hands away from your face, remember what God has said, and remember what he has done. What is in front of us is not simple, but it is not bigger than him. Great partners stand together. They needed their eyes, their ears, and their memory. And while great partners take a stand, great partners don't let you settle. Tell somebody don't settle. That was not bossy enough, try again. (laughs) You didn't inspire anybody with that. Mm -mm. Don't settle. Everyone has a breaking point. Everyone has a breaking point. When we are called to something beyond us, and make no mistake, I've said this before, God will call you to things you can't handle. Despite all the memes on Facebook found nowhere in the Bible, he will always call you into things you can't handle so that you reach for his help because he can handle it and he just wants you with him. Great partners don't let you settle. But here's the thing, as much as God calls you beyond you, which is such a gift and is so full of joy, he will always call you beyond you. He will not do that alone. So that when you reach your breaking point, you should never reach it alone. There needs to be a Joshua or a Caleb standing next to you. Like the day in 2020 when everything was upside down, everyone was mad in every direction and nothing was right and everyone was tired and everyone was alone and no, everybody had opinions and all the things. I was done. 
I was done, and I called my buddy Doug, and I said, Doug, you need to decide right now if you wanna help Canyon Ridge find a different lead pastor, because I'm out. But I don't want you to miss the most important part of that story. Did you catch the most important part of that story? I called my friend, who remembers who I am, who remembered what God said, and he said, no. Keep going, what's it gonna take I'm with you. There was a time in my life when depression wrecked our marriage to the depth of like, I don't think I can keep going and I'm pretty sure she doesn't want to. And I sat down with a guy named Barton. Did you catch the most important part of the story? I sat down with a guy named Barton who said, I'm with you, I've got you, God's got you, he's bigger, take your hand away from your face, keep going. And so listen, while there was a time in my life I was ready to quit, I'm so glad I didn't. 25 years into marriage, love and life with my wife. There was a time in my life I was ready to quit the joy of walking with this group of people in this season to see what God has in mind for all of us. And I'm so glad, five years in, I'm so glad I didn't. But I'm gonna tell you right now, without someone next to me who was on the adventure with me, who is a can-if kind of person, what's it gonna take? Who was the kind of person who could see beyond what was right in front of my face, who could see three, the kind of person who would take a stand and would not let me settle. This is what Joshua and Caleb stand up and said. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid. This may, you have a friend today that needs you to call them or text them and say don't be afraid, because what they're facing is terrifying, and it's about all they can see right now, and they need you to show up like Joshua and Caleb and say don't be afraid and don't rebel, don't run away, don't look for help somewhere else, don't take matters into your own hands. God has good in mind for you. He says they're only helpless prey to us. This is, what they, this is what Joshua and Caleb said about these giants with their big walls and their big cities. They're helpless prey to us. They have no protection because the Lord is with who? Us. Don't be afraid. So I don't know what you're facing right now. My question is who are you facing it with? Who is gonna stand next to you and say, keep going? Who's gonna take the adventure with you? Who will take a stand with you and won't let you settle? For the Hebrew people, the Joshua and Caleb were just shouting out, listen, I know that you only see the desert and slavery behind you, and I know you see big walls and big people and battles ahead of you, and all you can see within you is fear, but don't settle, they said. There's no other hope but God, and there's no other rescue than him. But good news, he's enough, he's strong, he's got us, he said, he promised, so let's go. Tell somebody, let's go. Because here's the deal. The same truth is true for every single one of us. Followers of Jesus, I wanna remind you, and any of you who are looking for better in your life and have not said yes to Jesus, I just wanna tell you, for us, there is no other hope. There is no other rescue than life with Jesus. Your works won't save you. Your bank account cannot rescue you. Your identity is not found in your accomplishments. Who you are is because of what God said and what he has done. He has invited you into life with him so that every adversity and every opportunity that comes out in front of you, you get to adventure with him and with his people. He is our hope. Jesus said it this way, there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. Joshua and Caleb were looking at a people who were totally right. Slavery, awful, ahead, we're gonna lose, except for one thing. There's one who rescued us. It's what Joshua's name means, by the way. The Lord saves. Yeshua, which is actually Jesus' name. The one who stood up and reminded them there's a way is the same one who makes a way for us. And so I just wanna tell you, if you're looking for a way, it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. And so you gotta keep looking at his life long enough to see that he is who he said he is, to say yes to him in every way that you can and invite him to lead you from where you are no matter how you got yourself there. And the good news is he's willing to meet you right where you are. There is no other way, there is no other hope. Some of you are followers of Jesus and you are wavering in your faith. And you just need to tap a friend and say, I need you to stand next to me. Stay calm, stay connected to those partners you need and stay the course. 
For some of you who are in a really strong season of your life, I just wanna tell you right now, you need to check in on your friends because some of them are not okay. They haven't told you that yet, they haven't shown you yet, and you don't wanna find out when it's past the breaking point, when they've already turned around. Check in on your friends and say, keep going, I'm with you, let's go. Great partners don't let us settle. So this week, if you've got somebody standing with you like that, thank them, honor them, encourage them. Uh, if you need to show up for someone like that this week, commit to doing that. And if there aren't people around you, we would love to support you and help you find some great people. Head over to canyonridge.org where you'll find everything you need to know along with a way to get in touch with us. If this has been helpful to you in any way, I encourage you, pass it along to someone else. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.